Alice Passetto, we will, she will talk about AGN Tor's detectability at submillimeters uh, wavelengths. And the introduction of Alice will be done by uh, Jose Luis. Thank you very much, uh, Rene. So uh, it's a real, a real pleasure to have uh, Alice here. Sorry, but for my voice, but I, I have a bit of a cold. Anyway, so Alice, uh, she obtained her bachelor and uh, a master at the Bologna University, and then afterwards she moved uh, to Bonn uh, to Max Planck Institute and in the group of uh, uh, Michael Kramer, and he, she did her PhD with uh, Alec. Alex Klaus, I think it was, and uh, working on uh, uh, polarimetric observations of AGNs. Uh, she is a world expert on uh, polarimetric observations, especially in infrared rotation analysis of AGN observations with uh, VLA. And after that, uh, she, well, she got uh, her PhD in uh, 2016, I believe, yes, and sh then she moved uh, uh, to, uh, Mex uh, to Dunam in, in Morelia, and, uh, and she has now one of these, uh, the cathedra, no? cathedra the, the, of Dunam, uh, uh, to work on uh, a compact spectrum object, I believe, no? in, in polarization and so on. And as uh, René mentioned, he, she is going to talk uh, today about uh, the de detectability of AGN torus uh, with uh, millimeter VLV. Oh, sorry, some millimeter VLV. Okay, thank you. So as as uh, already mentioned by Jose Luis, so I I now expand my research field to AGN torus. So I I work my my work was have, have been done on polarimetry, but yeah. So I expand this uh, research field thanks to this person. So this is the group. Maybe most of, of you already know. Uh, uh, Mayra Gonzalez Martin is the thinking head of all the all this project. And uh, uh, then we have um, her PhD student and master student, Donahi, Natalia, and Cesar are very promising students. And um, Mariela Martinez Paredes, that probably already uh, most of you already know, she is uh, another expert in the field, and uh, myself. So I don't want to spend a lot of uh, words on the introduction of about uh, about AGN, but I want to just mention that the large fraction of AGN emission is produced produced by the accretion disk and emitted in the UV and optical bands. And uh, part of this emission is re-emitted by the dust, so by the uh, emission of the dusty torus in the infrared, and by the, the corona of uh, hot electrons that re-emit this emission in the X-ray. So the infrared and X-ray are um, very useful and mandatory to characterize the, the central um, region of an AGN. However, another very important part of a uh, constituent of an AGN is the radio jet. The radio jet is, is very important to test and address a uh, very important question like what, what, what are we, which are the, the processes at, acting at the very center of the AGN and how, how powerful are the AGN and how is the launch and then the formation of the AGN jets. Uh, the radio jets emit synchrotron emissions, so they dominate uh, mainly in the centimeter band. However, uh, recently the uh, radio community astronomers uh, put a lot of effort in, um, in the observation of the radio jet in, with the v millimeter VLBI, reaching very high angular resolution and uh, in order to observe an image, the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. And this is a um, recent work done by Kim and collaborators. So, um, what happened in the submillimeter um, window? The torus has an estimated size less than 10 parsec from uh, high resolution, high angular resolution in the mid infrared data. ALMA the new millimeter interferometer has a very good angular resolution and sensitivity and it could be able to observe uh, the dusty structure ar around the supermassive black hole. But which are the conditions of the dust in this, in this band and is still the dust dominant in this uh, uh, window? So the idea behind this work is very simple. So we have 
this obvious uh, application of using ALMA in the AGN field, that is detection of uh, dust emission from the dusty torus, thanks to the high resolution and sensitivity. And indeed, there are several works that now I, I show you that try to detect and image the uh, dust emission from, of the AGN. However, there, is, there are no work analyzing under which condition it is possible and which are the suitable objects to, in order to detect, uh, properly detect the AGN torus. And it is extremely difficult anyway. Uh, so these are, sorry, these are the recent uh, works, some of the recent works, so in literature mm, there are a lot of, a lot more. So this is a work done by Izumi and collaborator. They study the central region of Circinus galaxies. It is a very complex uh, AGN. And they wanted to test uh, the multi-facing dynamic torus model. So this is, it is shown in this uh, picture on the right side of the slide. It's a very complex model. And this is the continuum image of band uh, 8, so 485 gigahertz. And as you can see, and as they claim, so the continuum emitting region consists in this, in this as they call, circumnuclear disk, a huge structure, so well above, um, uh, larger than the uh, size of the torus, so it's 74 times 33 parsec. Um, but still, um, something there is uh, there. Then another, another recent work is, uh, has been done by Combs and collaborator last year. Uh, they explore the uh, close environment of seven Seifert end liners. So they, um, uh, they study uh, different active uh, type AGM. And, and what they uh, found is uh, a continuum, this is the continuum in color, this is one of the seven, um, but still uh, they call molecular tori, and the central continuum is still a uh, point like source, is a point like sources, and through spectral index analysis that they perform, for example, for this uh, source in particular, they found a spectral, negative spectral index, that is um, an indication of synchrotron emission. Um, in the central uh, region of the AGN. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is the recent work by, done by Garcia Borillo in 2016, and this is the most promising uh, work. They claim the detection of an, an elongated continuum structure, uh, 4 times 7 parsec square, associated to the dusty torus. However, um, <clears throat> it's not uh, really a clear detection because looking at the, uh, the angular resolution of, of this uh, image, uh, this total is marginally resolved. It's among two and three being resolved. However, and, uh, and this is uh, NGC 1068 that is a very well studied and famous uh, AGN. And indeed, another uh, uh, work recent work by Manishi and collaborator on this NGC 1068 um, uh, give some in, an, other indication, but now with the molecular studies, this, that the torus is there, but is, is still hidden. So uh, the, the special resolution is larger. However, from the an analysis of the molecular lines, um, they claim that the torus should be should have dense molecular um, emission and is inhomogeneous. So <clears throat> there are several issues, and two of them are, are uh, pointed here. So the first one is a sensitivity issue. The, um, the torus peak at around 30, 30 micron, and the total flux expected above 400 micron is really a small fraction of the, um, the mid-infrared total flux of the dusty torus. And another very important issue is the jet contribution. The jet AGN show uh, this uh, synchrotron emission coming from the radio jet, and 
that, as I told you, has a, a main contribution in the centimeter band, but still there is a, a tail that can go towards uh, these uh, shorter, wa uh, shorter wavelengths. And indeed, this is um, a work that supports this, uh, this issue uh, by Izumi and collaborator on NGC 1097. So in red, red points are CO uh, emission line, and the blue uh, square are the continuum at 350 gigahertz. Uh, over time, and you can see that there is variability of the continuum emission, so this is not expected to be emission from the dust of the torus, but uh, could be the, the jet emission at that frequency that can have and can show variability at higher frequency over time. So, the last overview before telling you about our work, so what we we are going to do is, and what we have is emission of the dusty torus that peak around um, 30 micron, and we have the jet emission, uh, the optically thin synchrotron emission coming from the jet, coming from the, uh, the centimeter part. So we want to investigate in the ALMA range what, what happened in this ALMA range. So which, are, which is the dominant component? which is the condition of the dust at this, uh, wave, uh, at this band, and which are the, the suitable candidates for this kind of study. So our uh, paper uh, was born, <laughs> submitted in APJ with other collabor collaborators in the, in the institute, and we hack this, uh, this problem with two approaches. One is a theoretical way, and, another, uh, uh, and the other one is the, an observational way. We consider three ALMA frequency in order to cover all the bands, so from band three, seven, and nine, so among uh, 100 and 600 gigahertz. So let's start with the uh, uh, theoretical the study, the theoretical study of the torus. So we wanted to relate the um, the flux density uh, of the accretion disk. Uh, therefore, that is that is uh, um, re um, emitted by the by the dust uh, and extrapolated to the submillimeter uh, band. So we start um, using this scalar relationship. Uh, about the disk luminosity, so the, uh, um, the X-ray luminosity, and the torus continuum, so the luminosity in the mid-infrared, using the scaling relation um, uh, shown in ASMOS and Collaborator 2006. Then we extrapolate the luminosity in the mid-infrared towards the uh, submillimeter band using clumping model, that is the most used uh, model to perform SCD of the uh, dust emission in AGN. Mm, just a few words, so the, the clumping model has six parameters, so our extrapolation and our um, ratio between the luminosity in the mid infrared over the uh, luminosity in X-ray still depend on these six uh, uh, parameters. And the results uh, are shown here and the, in the slide um, um, that follows. So we explore all the param parameters, um, the parameter space combination at the three, three frequencies. So this is the, the, the lower frequency and this is the higher frequency. The contribution of the torus increase in the, in towards the right. And uh, so as expected, from this histogram, it is shown that the contribution of the torus increase towards higher frequency, as expected. So at three, 666 gigahertz. And then we also explore, um, we investigate whether the six, the, the, those parameters of clumpy could influence in the detection of the torus. And uh, again, as expected, the highest contribution of the torus um, is, is done uh, with considering higher numbers of clouds, higher uh, Y parameters of the clumpy model, large angular widths, uh, flat radial distribution, and large optical, optical depth. So that means that bigger and denser uh, tori 
could be possible to be uh, detected at this uh, in this at this uh, uh, frequency because this is um, at 666 gigahertz so the highest frequency so we did the same um, we follow the same approach for the radio jet and to extrapolate the contribution of the radio jet towards the submillimeter band we used the, the fundamental plan this is the fundamental plan relation relate it relates the luminosity of the radio jet with the luminosity in the x-ray of the accretion disk the super the mass of the supermassive black and the sup, and the mass of the supermassive black hole and we extrapolate toward the, the submillimeter band and this is our fundamental plan that still um, depends on the x-ray luminosity the supermassive black hole and the spectral index so <clears throat> we performed the same um, histograms for the radio jet at the free frequency and in the first uh, left uh, corner in the top left corner histogram um, one can see that the jet dominates equally at the three frequency considered in this, uh, in this study and here we examine um, how these parameters so the luminosity in the x-ray the mass of the black hole the spectral index can influence in the jet detectability uh, um, in this uh, in this study and the lowest jet contribution um, uh, is is done considering sources with high uh, luminous x-ray luminosity relatively low mass of the black hole therefore uh, mm, sources with high accretion rate and non um, no contribution uh, have been observed using different spectral indices then another test on the theoretical uh, point of view uh, that we have made was to study the detectability of the torus compared to the jet so and the result is in this table so here you have torus and jet at the free frequency and we perform the mean 10% and 90% percentages and the median percentage the minimum and the maximum percentage of the contribution of torus over the jet at the free frequency so just focus on the uh, last column and the uh, the highest uh, frequency that is the one for which the torus could be uh, could dominated could dominate so the torus the median value in percentage could dominate at this frequency with 96 percent uh, percent however the torus could be still as low as five percent and look at the jet contribution the jet contribution the median uh, value is low still very powerful jets can dominate at, uh, still at this frequency with a percentage of 95 percent and then the last things that we uh, analyze uh, was the detectability of the torus considering the uh, characteristic of ALMA so the sensitivity limits of ALMA here is the these two column describe the, the um, expected flux density in the submillimeter band considering two type of AGN having uh, hundreds of millijansky and uh, tens of jansky in the mid infrared at 12 uh, micron or well infrared thing and uh, just focusing again ah, and here is the sense alma sensitivity the the rms the one sigma considering one hour integration time and 10 10 hour integration time with alma so looking at the highest frequency the torus the median value of the torus is very very faint so it's very difficult to observe with alma um, still we made um, um, a consideration that a torus of one milli, milli, milli jansky could be observable observable with 10 um, sigma detection uh, using 10 hours of alma at this frequency still with uh, this the warning in our having the warning in our mind that the contribution of the jet can be 
can be present in the observations. So regarding the, uh, the observational approach, we uh, study the torus det detectability using four prototypical AGN that are listed here, uh, NGC 1052, 1068, the one uh, for which uh, uh, Garcia Burillo claimed to the detection of the torus, NGC 3516, and the quasar is Vicky. Um, we select this object with available archive and uh, data from literature in the mid infrared the, uh, radio and in the sub millimeter band. And we perform mid infrared and radio SCDs, better energy distribution, and we extrapolate uh, everything to the sub millimeter window. A few words about the data. So these three sources in the mid infrared are. Uh, all point, uh, point source and uh, are AGN dominated. So we uh, use Spitzer data, high and low resolution Spitzer data, while for NGC 1068, since it has a very complex uh, uh, source with uh, star formation and, and a lot of uh, stuff, we, we go for high angular resolution data in order to isolate the central uh, the central um, part of the AGN, and we use NNQ band data from T-Rex. While for, <coughs> for the radio uh, data, we select data from the archive and JVLA in, in configuration, A configuration, in order again to isolate the, the, the contribution of the synchrotron emission of the central engine. And in the sub-millimeter window, we collect ALMA data from the ALMA archive, and when not possible, we um, collect Karma and JCMT data already published. So this is the spectral fitting. We uh, investigate several models that are listed here. However, at the end, uh, we, we fit the mid-infrared data with the smooth dusting model, the one um, perf um, analyzed by Fritz and collaborator in 2006 because it was the simplest model that uh, doesn't need an additional component to provide a good fit. So and now here I want just to uh, uh, note, to make a note that this is not the, the, the aim of this, it was not the aim of this work to, to well describe the torus uh, of this AGN. We just needed a, a good fit in order to uh, then extrapolate the prediction toward the submillimeter band. And this is the total intensity radio spectra. So in blue are the JVLA data and red uh, square are ALMA data. We fit the radio, the radio data with a simple optically thin uh, synchrotron emission or combination of synchrotron self-absorption um, emission. And ah, yes, and the magenta point are the, the Karma, in this case, and JCMT data from literature. Um, we mark in a different color and with our arrows, er, arrows the, this uh, data from ALMA because they have um, angular resolution larger than 0 0.3 arc second. And this means a spatial resolution of hundreds of parsecs for NGC. Uh, 1062, uh, 1068, and 3516, uh, while a few kiloparsec for, for the quasar. So these data may uh, contain other contribution at this, uh, uh, at this frequency from other components. And this is the result of the extrapolation towards the, the sub-millimeter band. So this is, just have a look. Um, one by one. So I will describe you. Here is the uh, mid infrared um, fitting. This is the radio fitting, and this in the straight line is the extrapolation uh, uh, towards the, the sub millimeter band. So for the case of NGC 1052, it is clear that the jet dominates in this, in this area. So this data point. Uh, could be, uh, well, are uh, jet dominated. Well, NGC 1068 is a very complex, uh, as I already told you, source. Uh, we couldn't, and we try a lot, 
to perform a single mid-infrared uh, fitting for the extrapolation, but we end up with um, using two different uh, torus scenario for this, uh, for this source. So this means that the, the torus in NGC 1068 is very complex, the structure. However, if you look um, at the submillimeter part, so the, the data, the ALMA data are not seen to, to describe uh, um, a behavior, a torus, torus behavior. And uh, this, I just want to point that this data point is the, the point of claimed by Garcia Burrillo for the detection of the torus. And I will come uh, to this point uh, later in the, in the presentation. For NGC 3516, we cannot say um, much because we have just one uh, data point. Still, uh, it could be another, another component, synchrotron component that is emitting, ejected uh, at higher frequency. And the last one is VK1, the quasar. This is the most promising case we have. Although the three points, JCMT and ALMA, are um, well above the prediction, but the trend, so the decreasing in the flux density, as expected for, for, the, for the torus, is there. But um, there is a possible contamination from star formation or uh, other, um, other component that's um, uh, uh, extend into the narrow line region. So, um, as I told you, so this is this observational result is consistent with our, our theoretical result that the torus detectability increase from low to high accreting sources, and indeed, its VK is uh, among the the sources we we have the highest accreting source. The problem with this source is that it is too distant. So um, ALMA cannot um, resolve uh, the, the central part. <clears throat> OK, so coming back to the case of NGC 1068, so this is the, the, the Garcia Burrillo uh, point, data point, and we um, try to, to, to fit, to consider all the JVLA and ALMA data as part of the synchrotron emission, and clearly the fit is, is very good, with a very good statistics. And um, just a note that Garcia Burrillo mentioned that 18% of the total flux where they claim the detection of the torus could be contaminated from other uh, a mechanism different from the uh, dust emission. And from our calculation, we have seen that the jet at this frequency could be uh, um, as high as 94% of the flux. So <clears throat> this uh, data point, in conclusion, could be uh, emission from the uh, dust of the of the of the torus of AGN, but still uh, contribution of the jet is there and is has to be decontaminated. So the detectability of the torus is extremely difficult, and it seems that only extreme cases like dense, bigger, and bright tori could be uh, observable with ALMA, and we have to search for the right candidate like the high accreting uh, AGN with the um, always um, <coughs> having in mind that the radio jet can contaminate. So uh, we suggest to perform SED studies considering the radio data and uh, paying attention on the angular resolution in order to isolate the central engine as much as possible. And or um, as Izumi did, uh, made study of variability pattern because it should not be expected for for the for the emission for, uh, coming from the dust torus. Yes, so this is uh, the my last uh, slide. These are images of Morelia and the institute. You are very welcome to uh, visit us. And uh, Morelia is a, a very nice place, and the institute is great. Thank you.
thank you very much, Alice. Um, anybody want to ask? Uh, thank you, Alice. Very nice talk. Uh, um, very in interesting and instructive. So congratulations for your work. Um, I have a question concerning the, the results on NGC 1068. Um, if I'm not wrong, uh, Santiago Garcia Burillo et al. in the paper in, in 2016 made also, also made as SED fitting considering the ALMA data and considering a Taurus model. So the question is, how reliable is the Taurus fitting since it is an extrapolation in that point. And if they, I mean, how could they find that it was consistent with the ELMA data if you are saying that there's too far from that? Uh, do they use? Because I, I tell you, the. We try also to, to use the Spitzer data for this, for this source, but they, they are well above uh, this, uh, mm, this mm, mid-infrared spectra that we perform. So probably uh, the extrapolation we ma they made probably fit uh, in, this, in this data point, but uh, and if I remember well this paper, now I don't have on top of my head this paper clearly, uh, but it wasn't, uh, there were some upper limits also in the SED spectra. I don't remember well. Well, anyway, so the, the, SED, the Spitzer data uh, are well above, so probably the extrapolation go, uh, go very steep towards the submillimeter band. So, um, don't know, maybe, maybe could, could be, but still the Spitzer data has a very, uh, has a worse angular resolution and is including a lot of other stuff in the mid-infrared. And... Ah, this was searched in literature um, using also other data, try to, to see if maybe the Spitzer data, considering other, that although is a worse angular resolution, could um, uh, describe this part of the, of the data. But still, they, they didn't find a very good, uh, a very good uh, torus fitting. Uh, so we, at the end, decide to go for the highest angular resolution T-Rex data because we wanted to be sure not, not introducing uh, any other uh, star formation uh, emission in the mid-infrared. And from what I know, <laughs> uh, the, after the, the, the peak emission in the mid-infrared, all the models should um, decrease all uh, in the same way. So I don't see, um, well, it's just, it, uh, well, yes, is the, is the, is to, to know where the peak of the mid infrared is. And in this case, although for, if you consider also this peak that is at, at shorter wavelengths, still do not, that is the most promising uh, for this point, do not, uh, um, include, do not lie to, to this uh, data point. So, and from this analysis, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's not uh, correct, but still is an indication that synchrotron emission is still there. And indeed, what one uh, thing that I'm doing now with, the, with archived data of NGC 1068 is to uh, consider JVLA and ALMA data at high angular resolution and try to decontaminate the synchrotron emission uh, in the ALMA data, try to, to see which is the flux density of, uh, of the torus at this, uh, at this frequency.
very nice words. This remind me, me the uh, study about protoplanetarities in some extent. I would like to ask uh, several questions. For instance, this first one is, which is the, are the fundamental parameters that you can infer by the SED fitting from the spixir observations? And also, I would like to know which are your main assumptions to extrapolate to determine the flux density to the ALMA bands. I don't know if you have to assume some properties for the dots or perhaps some spectral indices. I don't know. Also, I would like to know which is which is the dust destruction from from these tauros. And or, um, finally, I would like to know uh, is there are some PV plots diagrams to infer PV plots, position, velocity diagrams to infer, for instance, the mass, the mass of the central part of these uh, tauros or galaxies. I don't know. Sorry, a lot, of, a lot of questions. The second question was about the dust sublimation from the inner uh, radius for these torus, which is related with the dust sublimation uh, from. What is the size? Uh, can you determine it? is the, the black hole at the center of massive is uh, the, this this radio change a little bit but are few uh, parsec wide and then if you had another question I don't remember <laughs> okay <laughs> no there are no special consideration we made so the um, Mid infrared spectra decrease with a spectral index of two, and uh, the, we assume a um, um, optically thin synchrotron emission coming from the jet with a slope of minus 0 0.7. So we just extrapolate with a straight line, no, no special magical things. I mean, 
I have a suggestion more than a question that uh, for the case that uh, NGC 1068 that is under discussion and I suppose if uh, Santi listen to you he claim about the the torus detection and and of course I understood that it's, there are many many problems and many things going on with 1068 because it's uh, very nearby so you have um, the greatest resolution so that this complicates a lot and and so I let me suggest that uh, I know that uh, there are BLTI data on this galaxy and, and it could be good to to compare in the mid infrared uh, the VLTI observation with higher resolution and I suppose I think that uh, Matisse has already has already observed this uh, with a very big resolution that uh, they are resolving micro arc seconds so that this is could be nice to see how is the behavior on this. If I can add on this, um, there is a recent work by Anne, ah, the surname, I, it's complicated. Uh, she's, um, uh, she's at Max Planck and by from et al, 2018, so very recently, on studying the VLBI emission of, of NGC 1060, uh, the NGC 1052, and they have seen an, an indirect uh, consequence of the torus that is an absorption in the in the radio in the radio spectra. So yeah, mm, so probably the, I can also have a look on the VLBI data of V. Ah, VLT. Ah, sorry, sorry, I, I thought VLBI, I'm sorry. Ah, okay, okay. In the Santi fit a clumpy torus, the model by Honig and et al. And so I think that uh, they, it could be good to have a look to this interferometric data because after this war there have been a lot of discussion from the model makers that uh, mainly Tristan and all these people that say that, that the torus do not exist uh, and so the the, the the mission in the mid infrared you are looking at is in the polar direction so that Mm, I think that it could be interesting to have a look to this interferometric mid infrared observation. Understood. Wrong. Um, my question was in the same line as uh, Pepa's. Actually, I was uh, asking if you previously considered um, using interferometric measurements both in the infrared and at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths to see if at least some of the most promising cases could be detected. So you know that there is now the possibility to observe with ALMA and the Event Horizon Telescope and the Global Millimeter VLVI Array. So perhaps there is a, a, a setup of particular baselines that may allow you enough angular resolution uh, for the most uh, for the brighter sources. No? So. Next, next step, we in the result of this paper is uh, we want to to select a sample of suitable uh, candidates, in principle to be observed with ALMA and VLA at the high, higher uh, configuration with a configuration. But we can also consider uh, to go to high angular resolution, mid infrared, and 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 radio to see uh, and to make this uh, the same analysis that we, we got in mind. Is it possible to observe dust from the torus with the, with the EHT?
This is thermal emission. One thing that is possible is to, to, to do this kind of study that I was telling you just a few minutes. So to see the, this indirect um, observational um, view, so this absorption in the, in the radio maybe, maybe is, is best. But yeah, so probably the best is what I what I tell you. So to select right candidates and to observe with ALMA and VLA because ALMA should be so only the array of ALMA is suitable for for uh, thermal emission and uh, synchrotron also. But what I was mentioning about the combination of baselines is that perhaps there is a particular set of short baselines that may allow you to have enough angular resolution still enough sensitivity to not so compact uh, mission. So, I mean, you have a telescope in Mexico close to Chile, for example, and perhaps if there is something closer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me ask, uh, maybe as it's a stupid question, but uh, I will take the risk to be stupid, that uh, uh, I know you are expert in polarization, and if you claim that uh, that uh, with this armor in, in, in this millimeter range, uh, you are looking to the, to the jet, uh, maybe you can measure polarization in that, and of course, in the, the torus have um, no polarization at all or very low and if you are looking to the jet is you you will measure synchrotron emission so you expect in principle high polarization i don't know yeah, it's, it's, how, how the jet is uh, bright and intense because if it is um, few uh, millijansky the, the fractional percentage of the polarization is only two percent so it's very very uh, low, and uh, so you, you one should have a long integration uh, on alma integration time to 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 detect few uh, percentage of uh, polarization. So it's, it's it's tricky, but it could be, of course, um, an indication that the emission is uh, synchrotron emission and not thermal. Any other question? Okay, thanks again to Alice.